Okay, um, I hope you're still all with us uh, in a conscious state of mind. Um, the next speaker I would like to introduce, the two last speakers, they will do a shorter presentation, so it's, we're going towards the Q&A. Uh, we will shorten the Q&A also a little bit. So the next speaker I would like to introduce is Olivier Taimans. He's a member of PSBE, and he will talk to us about one of the projects of PSBE as well. So uh, listen up closely. Right, I'd like to preface this by saying that uh, speaking English in front of 200 people is uh, way beyond my comfort zone. But I'm very sure you are a forgiving audience, so thank you for that. Uh, as Leonard said, I'd like to present a, a specific project of PhD uh, that I'm uh, more specially involved with. And I'd like to start by asking you if anyone knows this lady. She's obviously not uh, very famous, and she would deserve to be, or at least she would deserve to be more honored. Her name is uh, Cicely Saunders, and um, she worked as a nurse in Great Britain in the Second World War. Uh, but she went on uh, to train as a, a medical doctor uh, to be able to gain the necessary credibility to go, on to, to go on to found the movement of palliative care. And that's what she did, uh, became slightly known for. Now, palliative care um, is a movement within modern medicine that at last uh, ceased to consider uh, death uh, a failure of modern medicine and instead consider it a natural process through which the patient should be guided and, uh, and supported instead of just left to die uh, as a miserable failure. So, um, in palliative care, um, the, the emphasis is on pain and symptom relief. Um, of course, the aim is to, to in, in a word, to make patients as comfortable as possible for their last, last days or weeks or even months. And um, palliative care tries to meet the physical, the social, the psychological, and also the spiritual needs of patients. Now, the spiritual needs are, of course, um, a, a difficult topic sometimes in our society uh, that has gone uh, far from spiritual at times and in certain domains. And this inclusion of spiritual needs uh, and also the spiritual suffering of people uh, prompted uh, Cicely Saunders to develop the concept of total pain, which includes the, the physical suffering, the social alienation sometimes, the psychological distress, but also the spiritual needs of patients and the, the spiritual pain they, they, they uh, experience in front of this, uh, this threshold of death. Now, for this concept of uh, um, total pain, she was largely inspired by Viktor Frankl, who was an Austrian uh, psychiatrist, um, who was deported during World War II and stayed for no less than three years in Nazi concentration camp, which he survived. And uh, he went on after that to um, author several books about the meaning of life, no less. And one of the, one of, in one of these books, he wrote this, this central sentence in my, in my, in my um, feeling about suffering and about uh, palliative care, saying that man is not destroyed by suffering, just suffering. He's destroyed by suffering without meaning. And if people can find meaning uh, in the face of suffering, uh, well, the suffering is, is much better tolerated and uh, coping is much better. So, indeed today, uh, spiritual and existential factors are considered uh, key determinants of quality of life in people with advanced uh, cancer or other uh, uh, diagnoses uh, that can be life-threatening. And uh, very often, uh, spontaneously, uh, such a diagnosis, when you hear it, it triggers uh, a search for meaning and, uh, and uh, spirituality. So this need has to be met, of course, you know, in one way or another. Unfortunately, in our society, um, as I said, the spirituality has somewhat become taboo and is also often uh, equated with religion. Now, um, the intervention toward the spiritual and existential needs today um, 
for people who follow an established religion, well, they can maybe ask for a minister of their religion to come and support them. Uh, if they're agnostic or atheistic, they can have non-denominational moral support. But we have to, to, to recognize that uh, very often these interventions are not really adequate and many people, people are left with their existential suffering <coughs> in the face of death, which is quite unfortunate. Also, existential distress uh, in this stage of life is probably the least studied domain of uh, distress in uh, patients. And also, um, it's not addressed in training. I, I trained as a volunteer for uh, palliative care, which I did for a few years. And during the training, I asked the, the, the trainer, uh, so what about spirit, spiritual interventions, spiritual needs of patients? And she didn't really have an answer. She said, yeah, they send like priests and rabbis, but she had to admit that uh, quite often uh, it's found lacking uh, as, an, as, a, as, a, as an effective intervention. Now, what is spirituality if it isn't religion or if it only has a partial overlap? When you, could, you can see in this definition, so this definition is from the Consensus Conference on Spirituality in Palliative Care, so this is very specific. And as you can see, it has to do with meaning and purpose mostly, and also with relationship toward the environment, connectedness to the moment, to the self, but also to others, to nature at large, and also to the significant or sacred. And in significant, you find again the central concept of meaning. Now, all these elements uh, that were in the definition, they can be provided by mystical type experiences. Uh, when you have a mystical type experience, you, you experience all these, these effects also in a sustained manner. It doesn't last for a few days, but it can really change your life. And today, yeah, of course, mystical experiences, you can, you can get them spontaneously or through very, um, very uh, complicated uh, procedures like fasting, chanting, uh, um, rhythmic uh, stuff, etc. But the only reliable way to induce it these days is uh, psychedelics. And uh, they use, of course, the mystical type experience, but also the ensuing shift in, in perspective that, that comes with it, and which contains a change in assumptions and belief regarding all these things like nature being the self, body, but also specifically disease and death itself. You gain a, a truly new perspective on what it is to be sick, what it is to be dying, uh, what's the place of death, what is my place in the universe, does existence or consciousness go on or not, etc. And these are really uh, uh, lasting effects. Now, all of this has been studied. There have been uh, studies of uh, psychedelic therapy in palliative care in the first wave of um, psychedelic research with, uh, which uh, Mathieu talked about. Uh, and also a few studies in the new, uh, the, what they call the psychedelic renaissance. I don't have the time and I'm not going to bother you with all the details of the, the older study, the newer studies, etc. Uh, because uh, we can go very far in detail about this. But let me just say, uh, say a word about the benefits. Um, the first one, and that's more historical in the first studies of the first wave, uh, there was an emphasis on the reduction of physical pain, because that's what it was first tried for. And in fact, the, 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 the finding of meaning was uh, in the first studies some kind of uh, collateral uh, benefit. It was not the, the first intent of the study. So there's less emphasis in the modern studies about that. But uh, in the modern studies, uh, people take more antidepressants. People who are in palliative care are, are sometimes heavily medicated with antidepressants. And after a psychedelic intervention, uh, the need for antidepressants has a tendency to drop. They also experience an improved quality of life and acceptance of death. And corollary, of course, a reduction in the fear of death but also in anxiety and in demoralization, which is sometimes, sometimes very crippling in these patients. They also experience an improved, and this is very important, an improved quality of meaningful interpersonal relations. Um, people who are at the end of life quite often are extremely anxious and tense, and it's sometimes a real burden on the, on the loved ones who are around them and who would like to spend meaningful time with them, but the anxiety and the, 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 the despair just overpowers you though. And very often that's, that's uh, all they, they, they retain from it uh, afterward. And so the, the psychedelic intervention, the, the psychedelic therapy, 
can really help to, to, to get this tension down and spend the last uh, days, uh, weeks or months in really meaningful uh, interpersonal relations and exchanges with, uh, with uh, loved ones. And uh, unfinished business typically is uh, processed uh, in this period after the, the, um, the psychedelic intervention. Now, the good thing also about all these benefits is that they are effective not in just a small or, or average percentage of the patients, but really in a large majority of them. Like, we're talking about 80% uh, average in most studies. So it's, it's really effective for most people. The other thing is that uh, these, these effects are sustained up to years after treatment. Now, of course, uh, follow-up studies tend to be difficult with patients at the end of life, but some studies... <laughs> yeah. But some studies have included more broadly and uh, have accepted people who just had uh, a diagnosis of a, a disease that can be uh, life-threatening. And so sometimes they survive uh, the diagnosis. And I think the, the longest uh, follow-up study was uh, four and a half years after uh, treatment. And still 60 to 80 percent uh, of the patients considered that uh, this intervention had really changed their lives and, and can it, the, the effects continue to go on to that day. Also, finally, uh, all these effects uh, are not just uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, an hallucination of, of the people who, who, who experience them. They are confirmed by community observers, as they call them in the studies, who are uh, colleagues, loved ones, uh, spouses, uh, children, friends, etc. So everybody agrees on the fact that these people tend to be really more relaxed, have, have found more meaning, etc., and uh, in general have coped have coped much better with uh, their disease. So, yeah, instead of just uh, uh, sum summarizing benefits, I think it's important also to hear what the patients themselves have to, have to say. And up to 80% of them uh, ran the experience with uh, psilocybin or uh, a psychedelic among the top five most spiritually significant experience in their lifetime. And so it's on a par with uh, the birth of their child, their marriage, or uh, experiences like that. And um, some of them even rank it uh, as the, the single most significant experience in their life, which says something, I think. Also, to quote a patient uh, who was part of one of the studies, he went on to say after his experience that in, in fa finality, the cancer is not what is important, but the important stuff is love, and that's a, an insight that's shared by many of the, the subjects in the study. And the same patient said, this is the best I felt in years, although he still had his cancer and still was going to die, he said he felt the happiest uh, of all his life, which is quite impressive of an achievement, I think. Now, um, the current situation, yeah, one thing I forgot to say uh, also about uh, psychedelics and Cicely Saunders and palliative care is that um, the movement of palliative care came about in uh, 1967, if we really have to put a date on it. This is the, the year uh, that Cicely Saunders opened her first uh, hospice care institution um, in London. And she was aware, in fact, of the studies with the psychedelics at the end of life. But she was already heavily under fire for having introduced more heavily uh, morphine and opiates to relieve the suffering of patients. And this has been uh, a difficult battle already. And by 1967, as uh, Mathieu said, uh, uh, psychedelics had largely started to spill over into society and to, to wreak some havoc. And so Saunders was interested in the psychedelics, but she had to pick her battles because it would have been too much on her to try to introduce uh, psychedelics uh, above uh, uh, opioids, and she just uh, decided to, to not get into that, unfortunately. But now, this was the first uh, missed occasion, but now we have uh, a new occasion to, to make psychedelics and palliative care meet. So in the current situation, uh, quite a few patients uh, suffer from this depression and existential uh, anxiety, in the face of their life-threatening disease. 25% uh, if you take just a clinical depression, but if you add mood disorders in general and anxiety, you can get up to 40 or 50%. The, the figures tend to vary, but that's about, you can say, uh, uh, one in four to one in two patients uh, would benefit from uh, psychedelic intervention uh, in that case. 
Also, uh, we're working on it, of course. Uh, it's one of our aims, as uh, Adriana is going to, to explain after me. Uh, we'd like to, to bring about a general framework, a general legal framework for uh, the psychedelic therapy in Belgium. But being realistic, uh, we must admit that uh, probably this legal framework is going to take some time to, to, to establish, and it's, it's probably many years away. away. And of course, uh, the patients uh, tell, tell this to a patient who uh, is going to die probably in a few months or maybe one or two years. Well, these people have no time to wait. And also, if there is a long-term uh, problem with the, the use of psychedelics, they don't really care because uh, they will be dead anyway. So, for this, for this category of people, uh, several uh, countries provide the poss possibility of compassionate use. Compassionate use is the possibility that's provided um, to, for patients who are really in dire suffering or who have not too much time left to benefit from substances or medications that are not, all, not yet authorized on the market. And regarding psilocybin and uh, end-of-life um, diagnoses, there is a precedent in Canada where, um, well, in Canada uh, the law uh, says that uh, uh, compassion to use has to be granted and, and applied for and granted on a case-by-case -case basis. So every patient has, has to submit their dossier to the, the, the legal authority uh, that decides uh, if they, they are granted the compassion to use or not. And since August uh, 2020, where the first, first four patients were allowed uh, to have compassion to use, the non-profit, the Canadian non-profit Therapsil has held around about 50 Canadians to obtain this compassionate use under guided circumstances and noteworthy with psilocybin mushrooms, not with uh, psilocybin, pure psilocybin itself. So it's, uh, it's not a costly intervention, it can be very cheaply done. Um, they just have to pick their guide and, uh, and their mushrooms and, um, and they can get it. And already 50, 50 people benefited from here. Probably many more to come because uh, uh, administ administratively Canada has now facilitated the access to compassionate use. And also uh, good news is that a study of the outcomes of these people is underway and uh, the results will probably be avail available in a few years probably because uh, those things tend to take time. Now in Belgium, um, compassionate use exists as well. That's a good, one of the good pieces of good news. Uh, you have to apply for it uh, with the Federal Agency of Medicines and Health Products, uh, in uh, Dutch the FAGE, uh, in French IFMPS. Um, uh, different to Canada, uh, uh, in Belgium, compassionate use is granted on a substance and indication basis, meaning you have to apply for a substance for a specific indication. In this case, this would be psilocybin for uh, people who have existential distress uh, when faced with a life-threatening diagnosis. And from there on, uh, if it's granted, all the patients who fit the inclusion, and, uh, inclusion criteria and who don't fit the exclusion criteria can be eligible for a compassionate use without a further uh, a new application. Unfortunately, uh, in Belgium, uh, it seems that uh, compassionate use can be granted for pharmaceutical formulations like psilocybin, pure psilocybin, but not illegal drugs like, uh, as they call them, like uh, magic mushroom or uh, uh, psilocybin mushroom. So, uh, of course, this would be more costly, but uh, I don't think it's a real impediment. And the problem also in Belgium is uh, time and money. Um, to, to submit uh, an application uh, to the FAMP, to FAMHP, <laughs> sorry, uh, it costs at least 20,000 euros. So, uh, yeah, of course, we're trying to, to gather that money. It could uh, take a while, but we count, of course, on our generous audience. <laughs> so, <laughs> our plan. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll finish with that. Our plan is quite simple, in fact. Uh, it's to garner support uh, from the palliative networks in all three regions of the country. We've already started sending out uh, a folder, uh, an informative folder about uh, compassionate use of psilocybin and uh, all, all uh, the elements that uh, should be known. We've uh, raised some response, but uh, the, 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 the emails have uh, only 
recently uh, uh, left us, so we're really expecting to, to have a good response um, with this. Uh, to be able to create an informal coalition with all the stakeholders within palliative care, so uh, that includes phys physicians, the networks, as I said, clinics and centers, uh, all types of practitioners, among whom uh, the trained psychedelic guides that will be needed uh, for, uh, to, to, to accompany the patients, and also, of course, the patients and their loved ones uh, who are uh, a support of major importance. Uh, we're also networking with foreign initiatives uh, operating in the same field. Uh, I told, about, told you about Therapy in Canada, we're in contact with them. But there's also Xilonco, a group in France which uh, Vincent is also part of, and that is trying to set up a study of uh, uh, psychedelic intervention in palliative care. And uh, maybe along the way we'll find other uh, people to network with. Then when we have raised the necessary money for the application, we'll apply uh, put in the file for, for application for compassionate use. And doing that, we'll present a coherent plan uh, with uh, well-defined protocols of how the, 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 the sessions would go. Of course, inspired by, by what you've seen with uh, preparation, adequate preparation, maybe uh, several sessions, uh, and also uh, the necessary integration. And we'll also propose a set of inclusion and exclusion criteria. So, how can you help? How can the audience help? How can the people help? Well, uh, it's quite simple, of course. Um, you can donate. Uh, the, <laughs> the QR code is right there on the banner. Uh, you can incite people to donate also. The important thing is to spread the word about psychedelic therapy in general. And also about this project, uh, PSD's Compassionate Use Project in general. And uh, if you know people that are more specially involved with the, these questions, you can, of course, direct them to, to, to us to help. Uh, our uh, email address is available on our website. So uh, we hope to come back to you in uh, a few months, a few years, to update this, and uh, hopefully with success. And uh, it's really something I would like to see happen. Thanks for your attention. For the hardcore sticking it out with us, uh, we have Adriana Zimbru, our vice president. Uh, she's a pharmacist and she works in regulatory affairs. She supports PSBE with our legal framework uh, and its legal activities. And she's been a tremendous help for, uh, for all of PSBE, but also to me a lot. So uh, please welcome Adriana to the stage. That is the number of car accidents that happened in Belgium last year. And that was a pandemic year. A total of more than 42,000 casualties resulting in 516 deaths. Does that mean cars are bad? Maybe we should just prohibit them altogether given the hazard that they seem to pose. But that seems like a rather absurd solution to the issue because we know very well that Although cars can be used in very reckless ways, which can lead to accidents, they can also be used in very use useful ways, such as helping you to arrive here today at this event. Well, psychedelics are not all that very different, except they have much better statistics. <laughs> so far, we've heard a lot about their application, we've heard a lot about their potential benefits. So that begs the question, when will we be able to purchase them at our corner shop? Well, things are not quite that very simple. As Olivier already said, it would take a long time. And also, psychedelics, even though they have been used for millennia, these compounds are quite different from the usual substances that people in today's society are used to taking at a large scale. So before we can make them available at a large scale, we need to come up with a concrete proposal as to how this could look in practice. Because there are indeed a couple of best practices that should be taken into consideration in order to ensure 
an, an optimal psychedelic experience as well as a fruitful outcome that the participant can learn from. So these are what we call the best practices or driving rules, if you will. And of course, after that, we need to translate all of these into Belgian legislation, because psychedelics are today illegal in Belgium. There are also certain safety-related risks. So people with certain underlying conditions, such as neurological or cardiovascular issues, um, people that have family history of schizophrenia, should be screened out. In addition to that, um, potential interaction with certain medications that people are already taking should be carefully checked. So, additionally, what should be taken into consideration, and people who have been working with psychedelics know this well, is the importance of set and setting, as well as a proper preparation and integration of the experience. The substance itself does not bring any information with it. Everything that comes to the surface during the journey comes from within us. So it is up to us to work through all of that. And it can be hard work. So what we are trying to do within PSBE is to formalize some of these good practices and advocate for a regulated framework as to how society can best use these tools that exist today called psychedelics. It was more than 50 years ago that psychedelics were included in the UN Convention on Psycho Psychotropic Substances based on purely political reasons. What we consider is important is to shift the dialogue from a political, fear-based dialogue to a more evidence-based one. Because today we are at a phase where we have these tools, psychedelics, but we do not have a legal way of using them. We do not have a system by which we can teach people how to drive safely so that they can benefit from their value. And that is what we are working on. Building a future model that can be integrated into Belgian law and would allow for psychedelic-assisted therapy and also make research with psychedelics easier to conduct. I'd like to invite you to help us create this positive change. Because without the backing of people, nothing will ever move forward. So what are some concrete things that you can do to contribute? Well, first of all, would be to speak. If psychedelics spark your curiosity, share your knowledge and speak with people. If you have had a psychedelic experience and feel comfortable about it, share your knowledge with people and help them to understand what it meant for you. The second thing that you can do is join us as a PSB member. <laughs> because this change requires a lot of support, time, and commitment. So if you are, for example, working in policy, regulatory, lobby, or are simply interested in politics, we could use your help in finding political allies and in getting the legislative proposal passed. If you have clinical research experience, including compassionate use or an interest in palliative care, you could help in setting up the first psychedelic studies in Belgium, which would be some truly groundbreaking work. And lastly, but not least, we want to spread the word as much as possible and preferably organize more and more events such as this one in the future. And for that, we require dedicated volunteers. So what you can practically do is simply go to our website at psv.org slash membership form, fill in the form, and we will take it from there. In closing, and before we move to the Q&A, I would like to leave you in the words of a brilliant researcher, Marie Curie, who said, Nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. Now is the time to understand more so that we may fear less. Thank you very much. Okay, so we now have a little bit of time for a QA. and a um, The microphone will go around, so if there's people that want to ask a question, raise your hand and we need the help.